Three, two, one. Let's do it. Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Corey Hofstein and this is Flirting with Models, the podcast that pulls back the curtain to discover the human factor behind the quantitative strategy. Corey Hofstein is the co-founder and chief investment officer of Newfound Research. Due to industry regulations, he will not discuss any of Newfound Research's funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinion and do not reflect the opinion of Newfound Research. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Clients of Newfound Research may maintain positions and securities discussed in this podcast. For more information, visit thinknewfound.com. In this episode, I speak with Asif Noor, Portfolio Manager at Aspect Capital, where he oversees the firm's multi-strategy program. Asif has spent the last 25 years of his career developing systematic macro strategies, giving him a depth and breadth of experience to understand what it takes to remain competitive in this space. While a handful of low-frequency signals may have been sufficient a few decades ago, today, Aspect's multi-strategy program incorporates hundreds of alpha forecasts ranging from intraday to several months. But this evolution also brings new challenges, which we discuss at length in this episode. For example, how are new alphas introduced in old alphas sunset? How do you unify alphas of different magnitudes and convictions? Or how do you manage risk across so many signals? This conversation is chock full of the practical, real-world experiences of running a multi-strategy program. Please enjoy my conversation with Asif Noor. Asif, thank you for joining me today. I don't like to put too much of a time stamp on these episodes because I like them to be evergreen, but I know it's been a while. We've got the FOMC today. I know it's a bit stressful, so I appreciate you taking the time. I know you've got a lot going on on your side working on systematic macro programs, a lot of obviously systematic macro things going on in the market. So I think this is a very timely conversation to have. But let's start where I always start, which is for the listeners who maybe are not familiar with your work, can you give us a bit about your background and how you got to where you are today, leading up the multi-strategy program at Aspect? Yes. Thank you, Corey. Thank you for inviting me to be on this podcast. It's a pleasure and I'm honored to be here. And I've been listening to some of your podcasts and they're quite different to some of the content out there. So it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's a busy day, but it's also a very nice sunny day in London. So that offsets some of the stress, I suppose. So my name is Asif Noor. I've been building systematic strategies for about two and a half decades, so about 25 years, roughly. I started my career really building global macro strategies, so purely relative value strategies, within the broad sectors, equity futures, bond futures, and currency forwards. And over the last 25 years, that's expanded to now managing a multi-strategy program at Aspect Capital. For those of you who don't know Aspect Capital, we've been in business for about 25 years, initially building trend following, the price-based directional trend following strategies for a lot of our history of managing financial futures, non-financial futures and commodities. And for the last seven to 10 years, we've been focusing on building non-price-based strategies as well, and sort of a plethora of of what I would call conversion strategies and using data sources that are non-price-based and price-based as well when it comes to main reversion strategies. So my focus currently is managing global macro strategies, uh, relative value global macro strategies at Aspect, as well as 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 managing customized solutions and multi-strat programs. So I never like to waste an opportunity where a guest has a a real depth of experience in an area. I would love to get your perspective on how sort of systematic and global macro strategies have changed over the last 25 years of your career. Yeah. So I'm going to try to avoid saying that's an interesting question, Corey, because I think that's one of the most used words in interviews and client meetings. So I'm going to try to avoid that. So, so if I don't say it's an interesting question, don't take it the wrong way. But yeah, 25 years is a long time, actually. And you know, when we first started building macro strategies, basically using data that was mainly non-price based with some of the restrictions that we have. So basically not building directional strategies, building strategies that had no correlation to equity markets, no beta, sort of trying to build some strategies that were pure alpha, pure relative value, 
it felt a lot easier than it, than it has been for the last sort of 10, 10, 15 years. And that's mainly because I think a lot of strategies we, we built back in those days had a few biases. Perhaps we could categorize them as risk premium strategies currently. There was a lot of carry probably in there, a bit of trend and a lot, lot of value, but sort of correlated strategies really, when, especially when you think about forecasting currency markets pre-financial crisis, I think a lot of managers trading in that space had similar bets because you know cash yields in in the uk and australia were you know in the range of five to seven percent so you had those carry currencies those sort of commodity heavy currencies also had high growth rates so from a fundamental macro perspective you were along the same markets and they had been trending the same way the dollar had been weakening for a long time so in a way you were sort of in similar bets but over the last i would say eight to ten twelve years things have changed a lot i mean a lot of these exogenous shocks that you didn't have to really cater to and worry about have been happening more and more. It feels like it's happening more and more as we enter what we constantly keep referring to as a new environment or a challenging environment. So whereas previously we used to think about a static allocation of risk to a number of forecasting models, we have to be a bit more dynamic. Markets are pricing in. So information technology, there's a lot more information available to investors, which means that things are arbitraged away a lot quicker. And you have to dig a little deeper to find forecasting relationships or anomalies that exist to forecast these markets. So in that sense, we didn't have the concept of alternative data. Medium term frequency to build macro models was okay. You know, monthly frequency data was fine. Monthly rebalancing was fine. And the breadth of assets has increased as well. So it's sort of with technology, with data, and with, the, with more of these exogenous shocks, more of these dislocations that we see, it does make systematic investing more challenging. Well, I wanted to start with that perspective of history because we are going to spend quite a bit of time going deep on Aspects multi-strategy program that you lead up. And I think this is one of those areas where listeners are going to get to the end of this conversation and say, wow, there, there's a tremendous amount that's actually going on sort of behind the scenes as we, as we peel back the onion. What I, where I wanted to start, not only with the perspective of history, but maybe at a very high level, you could explain what, what the actual objective of the program is and maybe how those objectives translate into the overarching, more general strategy design. Yeah. No, Corey, I think that's quite important because, uh, you know, when, when I was asked by the Aspect Board to take over the multi-strat program, we spent quite a few sessions actually just narrowing down what the objectives are because I think you've hit the nail on the head. The objectives should really fit into the design of the program. And I don't think it does in, you know, for a number of other cases that have come across, you sort of fall into, okay, this is an interesting program and now let's retroactively figure out what the utility function of this program is. But I've learned over... The, so many years of building systematic strategies that actually nailing down that what is a utility function, you know, what niche is it trying to cater to what's a, what's a client a utility here, especially when you are working in a firm like Aspect that has a number of systematic strategies, it becomes quite important to establish what the utility function of each of our programs is because, you know, we don't want to muddy the water. We want to be quite clear to offer the investors the right product. So the objective here is, in my mind, quite simple. It's a multi-strat program. It's not a combination of all the models that we have at Aspect. We have currently over 250 individual forecasting models. So it's not a combination of everything that we do. And that's because we are trying to deliver our investors a smooth, consistent return profile with diversification to any of the risk factors, and more importantly, to equity markets, to bond markets, and to trend and macro. So any sort of common hedge fund indices and to any of the common systematic factors that you come across. It's a very simple objective, but I think it's not as easy to achieve and it gets harder with every passing day. And so what do I mean by smoothness and consistency in return profile? With systematic strategies, the favorite question of clients and prospects is, which environment is the strategy supposed to work in and which environment is it not supposed to work in? Well, by definition, I'm trying to deliver you a consistent, smooth return profile. So it's, it's supposed to work in all environments. Well, is it an all-weather product? Well, I'm not very fond of that term all weather because it means, you know, it sort of discounts what we're trying to do here. You know, we're trying to combine a set of alpha models, forecasting models, return forecasters to deliver a consistent return stream that is going to deliver you the returns in every environment that the world may throw upon us. One of the phrases we're going to use quite a bit in this conversation is alpha signal. And 
one of the things that maybe has surprised me after doing six seasons of this podcast is when you talk to a large number of systematic quants, the phrase alpha signal actually can mean very different things depending on who you're talking to. So just to make sure I'm on the same page as you and the listeners are on the same page, when we say the phrase alpha signal in this conversation, can you maybe define what that means to you and provide a naive example of what that might look like? Sure. Again, I agree with you completely on that. You know, some people think carry is not an alpha factor. Some people think momentum is not an alpha factor. And I think curry, it's dynamic, to be honest with you. I think it depends on the product that we're working with, that we're talking about. For the multi-strat program, the way I judge an alpha signal is really by correlation of its return profile to other things like equity beta, for example, or to any other risk factors that, that I may be looking at. So I don't mind having a systematic carry factor in my book, as long as it's doing something dynamic, something different. So carry factor may be move away from a simple premia to an alpha factor in the way we construct it. So we may construct it by having an element of timing, of actually not having a dynamic allocation to capture carry throughout every time period, but you may only capture carry over certain time periods. You may also have some non-linearity in terms of how you build it. And that sense becomes an alpha opportunity as opposed to a, a simple premier factor. So I'm not fond of this alpha beta separation because actually it's really subjective on which product you're referring to and how you actually construct it. So you can't just label and say, all my momentum, my value, my carry is going to be my non-alpha factors and my true alpha are my shorter term arbitrage opportunities. Because even your shorter term arbitrage opportunities, you'll be surprised to see how much carry <laughs> comes into a lot of these models in reality. You know, There's a lot of directionality, a lot of beta that comes in. So you have to be very careful of how you define and how you construct these, these anomalies. Based upon that answer, I'm, I'm a little hesitant to ask this next question because it might be redundant, but I want to ask it anyway, which is when you think about the alpha signals that are being used to drive the multi-strategy program, you know, you mentioned things like carry and momentum. Do you find that they fall into the natural topology that I think most quants would be familiar with, right? Things like value, momentum, carry, seasonality. Or do you find that most of the alpha signals you focus on are truly orthogonal to traditional research? I'll give an example, right? Going back sort of two decades, when we started building these models, we had 18 of them, 18 to 20 different models. And to make it simple for our clients to understand, we went value technical sentiment because that made sense. We just bucket them into these broad categories. You could take those value technical sentiment models and bucket them into carry value seasonality and, and so on. Today's implementation, today the way I categorize these alpha opportunities in the multi site program is within 14 broad investment themes. And those 14 broad investment themes are really designed to capture sort of cross correlation between those models. So if you take our 110 individual models we have in the multi strat program and run a simple clustering algorithm on them, you know, we can cluster them into 14 broad opportunities. And then you sort of look at those bins and you say, okay, what are these bins roughly trying to capture? Well, interestingly, bin number one has a lot of models that try to capture sentiment using option markets. Well, let's call that option market sentiment. Well, bin two looks like a lot of our momentum models, but they're on the faster scale, faster horizon, that, and that means that they're quite lowly correlated to our medium term momentum. Let's call them fast momentum. You know, you can go down, you know, some of them look at sort of curves across commodities, fixed income and currencies sort of twisting around in a time series fashion. So we can call them curve dynamics. So for me, it's, you know, you can call them bin one, bin two, bin three, bin N. It's really the clustering and the relationship between them, because ultimately what I don't want is all of them to line up and lose money at the same time. So as a result, I guess to answer your question directly, we don't sort of categorize or label them in the normal topology because we don't need to, right? Because we do, even when you, call, when you think about seasonality, seasonality factors today are quite different to what they were 10, 15 years ago. When I say factors and models, I use, them, use that interchangeably. So you don't need to, you know, because seasonality could be done using machine learning. Seasonality could be done, you know, using different data sources. So... If you forecast models trying to capture seasonality using non-traditional data sets, does that fall in the all data category? Or if it's done using some machine learning, does it fall in the machine learning category? So it's really just, you know, we don't need to sort of label them. And I guess 
15 years ago, 20 years ago, a lot of investors, when it came to quant strategies, there was a lot less understanding of quant strategies. We used to be called, you know, black box approach, don't want to touch it, don't understand it. And so to simplify things, we would categorize them into high level categories, like I mentioned, value, sentiment, technicals. We don't need to do that anymore. You know, we have chat GPT, everybody can use chat GPT to open that black box. So yeah, we actually label things the way that's intuitive and based on a clustering methodology. You somewhat alluded to this in your last answer, but the number of alpha signals over the last 10, 15 years that you would incorporate into a program like this has grown by an order of magnitude, call it 10, 15 signals, maybe 20 years ago to potentially hundreds of signals today. Can you talk a little bit about your process for what it takes to introduce a new alpha signal and then maybe conversely how you think about sunsetting old alpha signals? Yeah. So, and I think that's the most important piece of investment philosophy that investors should focus on. You know, they talk about past performance grade, they talk about what made or lost you money, fine. But actually, you know, ultimately it's this quantitative strategy, systematic strategy. So actually your research process is quite important. And I always talk about investors, you know, they always say, well, what should be a red flag in terms of losing confidence in, in the programs you manage? And that should really be when you stop introducing new alpha sources or in fact sunsetting old models because that means that you're not really evaluating your current set of models you know we, our firm belief is that no set of models are actually good forever so you don't just develop models release them allocate risk to them and then let them be for the next decade and go to the beach or whatever so it's about constant evolution because if you think about what things are driving markets today versus 10 years ago it's a different set. It's a, maybe a, some of the models are overlapping, but there's a lot of different sources. So, you know, step one for us is actually a high level blue sky session. And I say high level, I mean, including researchers, the PMs sitting together and thinking about ways to forecast markets with some sort of envelope around that in terms of the strategic direction of, of where we want to go. So if it's a macro program that focuses on non-price based models, that's the agenda, that's sort of the envelope. Or, or if our focus is we need to really beef up our emerging currency exposures, emerging currency models, but that's a little bit of a direction. But essentially we are thinking about a, a way of forecast currency markets, equity markets, bond markets, commodity markets, and not what would have actually forecast markets in the last three, five, 10, 15 years, but what do we think will drive returns in the foreseeable future? It doesn't need to be a decade out, it can be for the next three years. So that I think, Corey, is, is very important and actually a good exercise to get everybody involved because you know we hire quite talented individuals and one of the key elements that I want from them is intuition and an understanding of what we're trying to do. And this idea generation process actually gets a lot of that out. So, you know, step one, pool a number of ideas that have some economic rationale, some philosophy behind it, has some raw data that we can utilize to build those model sets. And then of that set of ideas, we then filter them into a smaller set, like a high conviction list of models that may deserve a research allocation, a resource allocation. And every researcher then gets allocated a project. The timeline is usually two to four months to, to take that project from start to finish. And during that time period, we have meetings on a weekly or fortnightly basis. And each researcher is encouraged to present their findings, sort of the empirical investigation. And the other researchers, their job is to actually try to find weaknesses in that defense of that research. So if you think about, you know, you have eight to 10 researchers, you're investigating about, you know, 30 to 40 ideas a year. And a hit rate is not very high. It's about 8 to 12 percent a year. So you're roughly introducing three to five models a year. And unfortunately, given how many models we have and given how the markets evolve and change, we also have a lot of models that are on the watch list or are under review. So we'll end up retiring one to two to three models a year. But the process of Retiring is a lot harder than the process of introducing new models. Introducing new models, you're constantly improving the process because the tools and techniques you have to do the research constantly get upgraded. So we have an extended process of actually a feedback loop of researchers defending and presenting their findings, uh, ways of actually bootstrapping and robustness checks. And then the final stage is to present that new research, that new model and with the allocation to the investment committee, which then goes through their oversight responsibility to make sure that they're comfortable with that model that's been introduced.
I always think that this is where the real alpha in the conversation is. People always want to talk about what are the signals, but I think that it's the process element when you talk to quants that is hugely valuable when it comes to actually running a quant operation. One of the things that immediately comes to mind for me when you're talking about only potentially introducing, call it that 8 to 12% of new research into the portfolio in any given year, is that you're going to have a pretty substantial research graveyard that three or four years from now, you might be considering a new, you know, alpha research project that actually might have relevance from something that was researched four or five years ago. How do you think about maintaining that archive so that it's useful to future researchers? Yeah, that's a difficult one. And, you know, we have some researchers that have been here many, many years and, you know, they are the deep pools of knowledge <laughs> of those graveyards. And, you know, a lot of times somebody on the investment committee will say, ask, you know, X, Y, Z person, because I'm sure they've done this five, six years ago. You know, Corey, even that graveyard has a half-life to it, right? Because something that you investigated five, six years ago probably deserves another investigation now, because as I said, the quality of data may have changed. The investment horizon may have changed. And the way it was investigated by, may have changed as well. I mean, we do a lot more machine learning than we did now than we did five years ago. So actually, you don't really need a very extensive historical log of ideas you investigated. And you do need some sort of a memory. And, you know, you can we have a database of things that we keep that have been investigated. It's unlikely that something that has been categorized as failed research over the last three, four years will come back in vogue because there will be quite fundamental issues with that research. As an example, you know, we look for consistency across the different markets that we forecast. So if you're forecasting 20 equity markets and this particular model only forecasts with some statistical significance only 10% of those markets, well, that's a little bit odd, right? That's a little bit difficult to overcome. Of course, you can think about exposed why those two markets work, but that's not how we do research. You know, if you think that of the 20 equity markets we're forecasting, only two will have alpha because of using this raw data set, you should have written that in the economic, in the investment and data generation process. You should have just said, actually, this will only work for NASDAQ and S&P because this is US-centric data and there's a lot more better quality data in terms of the data quality, as an example. So yeah, going back to your original question, I don't mind reopening a research project for an idea that we had more than five, six years ago, because that might still have some opportunity there, as long as the idea is still relevant. When it comes to forecasting and alpha forecast, my experience is one of the things that's crucially important is the certainty around the forecast, right? You can have a very high conviction signal and you can have a very low conviction signal. How does that uncertainty in a forecast factor into the portfolio construction process for you? Yes, and this has changed as well, Corey. As I mentioned, when we first started building systematic strategies pre-financial crisis, we had the firm belief that the size of this forecast, the size of the score, as we call it, is related to the conviction. So higher conviction, higher signal strength, would mean that you know we had more alpha opportunities. So there we can actually then size your risk based on, you can say, well, you have a very small score there and, and hence you should allocate less risk. And when you have a higher, stronger signal, then you have higher risk. So that's one way of doing things. The other way is the direction was magnitude argument. So you can say, well, you know, 70 to 90% of my alpha comes from getting the direction right. And the rest of it is magnitude. So I don't really mind if my signal strength is, is really small, I'm still going to blow that up. In some cases, it becomes a bit silly, right? Because if you have a very small magnitude of, of, of a score, and you're still blowing that up, it doesn't make much sense. So the way we do this is it's a case by case basis. It depends on each of the different models we look at. We evaluate that based on directionality versus magnitude. We also look at signal strength versus alpha opportunity. In most cases, actually, it's quite continuous for us, i.e. direction has more alpha opportunity than magnitude. But it really depends on whether you're building a divergent strategy or a convergent strategy, and also depends on the size of the investment pool. So if you are looking at forecasting 20 equity markets, it's unlikely that all of them are going to be shrinked towards zero. Whereas if you're forecasting only two markets, then actually the magnitude doesn't matter. If you might measure constant risk, you always ones or negative ones on that. So it really is a case by case basis. In our pre-call, 
you mentioned that when it comes to allocating towards different alpha models, one of the approaches that you lean heavily into is hierarchical risk parity, which was, I believe, originally proposed by Marcos Lopez de Prado. And that's an approach that relies meaningfully on some sort of measure like a covariance matrix, whether it's explicitly a covariance matrix or, or not, it, it usually starts at least in the naive literature with the covariance matrix. And when you start to talk about hundreds of alphas, that estimation error of s sort of self-similarity across alphas becomes a numerical problem, right? Understanding how to actually do that clustering is an important issue. I was curious if you could talk a little bit about how you think about tackling this problem, making sure when you go to allocate risk across these different alpha clusters, you're not unintentionally over allocating risk because you have this estimation issue. Sure. So I've come across various pieces of literature and also various debates internally about how to solve. Basically, what you're talking about is estimation errors within the covariance. It's not just within HRP. It's across a lot of things in terms of risk targeting that we do. And there's a lot of statistical techniques to robustify your covariance estimates. And, and you can do that. And in some cases, we do apply those techniques. But ultimately, what you're referring to is your algo is telling you to allocate risk in a certain way. And actually, for whatever reason, the discretionary trader in you is saying, I am not quite comfortable with that, right? So you're overlaying some biases and you can make yourself feel comfortable that those biases are justified because you can shroud them in sort of risk management. <laughs> but ultimately, that's what they are. You're saying, well, the covariance isn't quite accurate and actually doesn't really know everything I know. So I'm not comfortable with that allocation. And the way I solve that problem Maybe it's a good thing, maybe it's a bad thing, it depends on who you are, but is with a set of constraints around those mins and max bounds, uh, ranges around what I'm comfortable allocating risk. Because ultimately, I'm the portfolio manager, the risk is on my shoulders to manage that portfolio. And if I think that the algo will come up with some corner solutions, corner allocations that I'm not comfortable with, I need the authority to override that. So putting envelopes around allocations of risk to individual models, cluster of models, types of strategies is how we are looking to solve it. That's one element of it. The second element of it, I think, is using a reasonably long look back in your covariance estimates so to smooth out a lot of that jitter. And the third element could be to make the change in allocations a bit sticky. So once you are actually, you know, let's say you run the process on a quarterly basis, you have your HRP weights based on your limits that you're comfortable with, you only let the next quarter, the change be a certain percentage from that from, you know, so sort of have a starting point. So over a period of X quarters, you move away from that, you know, gradually, but you minimize the risk of whipsawing between the allocations up and down because certain change in covariance estimation. When you talk about alpha signals across different sources, one of the things, one of the problems you run into is that those alpha signals can have different units or very different magnitudes. So for example, if we were just looking at naive momentum scores, a longer term momentum score likely has a much bigger magnitude than a short term momentum score. Or if you're looking at momentum scores versus say value or carry scores, again, they're going to have entirely different units, which they're being measured in. Given that you're trying to combine all these alpha scores across a variety of different sources, how do you think about normalizing them so that they are cross comparable without necessarily losing valuable information? Yeah, so this is a challenge when you move away from building pure RV strategies, pure RV portfolios to portfolios that have some directionality. And especially when you look at models that have directionality based on momentum, for example, which is the point that you bring up, because obviously you're thinking, the stronger the momentum signal, the more conviction of that trend continuing. So if you actually normalize and standardize your risk target every time, you're squashing some of that conviction, really. It goes back to the conviction point. And so as for the RV portfolio, you know, we can measure constant risk, and it's less of a challenge there because you know, it's not so much of an issue in terms of normalizing or standardizing. So for the momentum or the trend or the directionality bit of the portfolio, we do allow a little bit of flexibility in terms of risk targeting, and it's not a fully uncapped 
risk targeting, but there are various ways of modulating the risk target around your benchmark to make sure that you are not completely giving away that information edge. So let's say you want to target 10% annualized risk in your portfolio, and it really comes down to what the maximum risk you're comfortable taking is. It's, you know, it's not the flow that matters, it's really the cap. So if you're comfortable taking 15% vol, you put a 50% band around your target, let's say, and really you allow your directional models that do have that tendency to outperform based on strength to actually deliver higher than average risk in certain environments. And in some of the research we've been doing more recently, even in the macro side, we're seeing a lot more of that sort of a conviction filter, sort of a non-normalized distribution of risk in a way for the models. But I don't, at least I haven't come across any other sort of super sophisticated way of doing it, except to just targeting constant volatility will squash that conviction and that strength of the forecast. Can you talk a little bit about your approach to combining alpha signals? So for example, are you combining unique portfolios for each alpha signal and blending those portfolios? Or are you combining the signals into a single forecast for an asset class and then running some sort of optimization, maybe something entirely different? Yeah. I mean, we do a little bit of a hybrid of the two things that you mentioned. And I think in an unconstrained framework, it boils down to similar things. So if you think about each of our 100 models, let's call them as different fund managers, you know, each of them have a view on, on a set of markets that they follow a forecast. And we get that view in whatever format, like you may have rankings, then somebody else may have, you know, portfolio weights, a third person may have buy or sell signals. Our job within the multi strat side is to actually take those alpha views, forecast scores, and normalize them and to put them in a framework that can be compared cross-sectionally. So that's the first step. But each of those hundred models is treated as a long shot or or long, you know, it's a long shot portfolio. It could be directional or non-directional, uh, sort of at a standardized risk target, unless in some cases we need a range of volatility around the target. So that's step one is to get a handle on each of the models that can be cross-sectionally compared and hence combined into a portfolio. And because we are at the moment in an unconstrained framework, we can actually reverse optimize those views and create forecasts. The next step is to actually combine those portfolios, those 100 portfolios into one set of global portfolio, which then gets turned into implied forecasts and then put through an optimizer, mainly because we don't live in a world that's unconstrained. <laughs> so, you know, we have various levels of risk limits and constraints that are put in place, which is why we use and need an optimizer. So combine those 100 portfolios, make sure that we are able to allocate risk to them in a way that's comparable, and then feed them into an optimizer to apply the limits. How do you think about unifying alpha forecasts that are over different time horizons. So that is challenging part of my job as a multi-strat portfolio manager, because again, and I think that makes it, it's a little bit easier than it would be if, you know, given how aspect is structured, you know, we do believe in collaboration across the different investment teams. So we have, you know, various research teams across, we have multi-strat team, a, a macro team and a, and a trend following a risk premium team. But collaboration is quite important in my role. So, for example, if you're getting an alpha forecast or, or model from the macro team, beyond just giving me their positions for the multi-strat portfolio, they have to give me a lot of other information that allows, uh, helps me with the portfolio construction process in terms of, you know, the alpha decay properties, basically how they want to roll that model set. But that alpha decay and what type of trading algo they like to use for that alpha model becomes quite integral in how we construct the portfolio. And in a way, if we are looking at a timeline of a 24-hour timeline, you know, we optimize the multi chat portfolio 12 to 15 times a day, mainly because we get alpha forecasts of over different horizons. So we may have a macro model that has a medium-term horizon, so it doesn't really mind whether you execute it over a VWAP over several hours or a TVAP, you know, or any of these simple slicer algos, whereas we have short-term opportunities that come in random times of the day that need to be executed within a certain time frame. Otherwise, the alpha is, is no longer available. So the key for us is information sharing, but also build that into the portfolio construction process and then pass that information out to the dealing desk, which then is able to execute those trades based on where the trade has come from. The challenge becomes if you have a trade that's the same side, 
but that's come from two different sources, you know, two different alpha forecasts of conflicting horizons. So you may have a model, a trade that's, you know, by 1,000 lots of S&P, 500 is from a shorter term high alpha signal, and 500 is from a slower alpha decay signal. Does that mean that we should do the all 1,000 at the same time? Because the shorter term signal is telling you that there's alpha there, so let's get that done. We don't take that Take that view. We actually do the 500 that comes from the shorter term signal separate to 500 that's from the longer term, because ultimately somewhere along the research process, we've baked in market impact and slippage. So actually, we know that 500 is a, we are okay to implement this 500 without incurring the market impact and the slippage, which may destroy the alpha if you actually go beyond that 500 lots. And that's only possible in the framework that we have where we share information and it's one umbrella building these portfolios. Somewhat on the same theme of thinking about these signals over different horizons is the sort of conditional interaction between these signals. So as an example, when you look at long-term forecasts, very rarely is it the case, at least in my experience, that the alpha is actually realized continuously over that period, let's say the one month forecast, almost never do you get all the alpha in equal increments every day. Rather, what often happens is, is it sort of happens in a much shorter, unpredictable window, which in theory can make it a lot more sensitive to what short term alpha signals happen to be saying at that exact time when the long term alpha is realized. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you think about the conditional interaction between these different time frames. I'm not sure I agree with the point that actually because longer term alphas, we don't know when that longer term alpha will be realized. If it's something that's over a three month horizon, this is month three that we realize it or month one. And if the shorter term signals are telling you that there's opportunity there, we should then make sure we execute that longer term alpha. I think it goes back to what that alpha opportunity is, what that data set has been used to build that model, which doesn't, I don't think that it's a hard one really because what you're saying is that the shorter term alpha has more information than, than the longer term alpha because it's telling you that actually it's not a three month horizon opportunity, it's a one month horizon opportunity. And the shape of that return opportunity is also different. It may have little return profile, return opportunity over the first month, but the last two, three months, it may have the most of the opportunity. So we take the view of sticking strictly with implementing the, the alpha opportunity based on what the underlying investment team informs us and actually don't speed up or slow down the execution based on on the other signals. When you talk about having hundreds of alpha signals, the question of marginal benefit comes to mind. So I'm going to propose a hypothetical to you. You have a choice. Your research team can find a totally new independent alpha signal, but it's low accuracy, so you have low confidence in it, or they can enhance, slightly enhance an existing alpha source, but that enhancement is high confidence. Which would you pick and why? I would pick the enhancement of the existing strategy. When you say the new model, you have low accuracy. I already don't believe in backtests that much, right? All backtests look really good, 45 degree line, you know, bottom left to top right. And so if you're starting premises, I'm not quite convinced about this backtest. You should really have no reason to doubt the backtest because you need to discount that by a large margin, large factor anyway. So if you're starting premises, I'm not quite convinced about this thing that's, that I've not traded at a simulation. Well, that gives me zero confidence in that signal really. Whereas the one that you're talking about enhancing, well, it's still in your process because it's delivered some returns over its, its history. So out of sample period is, is much more crucial for me. And now you're saying that you can actually improve that even further. So probability wise, I would think that I have a better chance of that model that's already live delivering returns in the future. With this next question, you've already touched on it a bit, but I don't want to make any presumptions. So I want to draw it out explicitly. I may <laughs> no, no, I don't think you will. But I, 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 you know, you've sort of mentioned the constraints you put within your allocation process. And, and we're going to touch on that with this next question, which is how you think about balancing conviction versus risk management. So for example, let's say there's a disproportionate number of, I'm going to say independent in air quotes here, but independent alpha signals that all converge on the same trade, whether directional or non-directional. Do you think that 
that's a time to lean into that conviction when all of these theoretically independent signals are saying, hey, you should execute this very similar trade? Or is that something that should be tapered for risk control reasons? Yeah, you see, Corey, that worries me a little bit. Like if all of my signals are telling me that this is the right trade, that means that as a portfolio manager, as somebody who manages risk, I'm more worried about the downside, right? I'm less excited about the fact that things are all lining up and telling me to go long S&P, short FTSE. I'm more worried that what if that trade is just loss making and now I've added a lot more risk. So I would really lean more towards risk management because think about philosophically, we've built these hundreds of models because they have supposed to have low correlation between them. For some reason, they have that correlation structure has broken down and they're now highly correlated. And then you have a bit of a concentration risk going on there. And the downside is a lot, lot costly. It's, it's a bit asymmetric. And that's mainly, be, probably if I were 15 years ago, I would have a different answer, but I've been doing this a long time. And you know, you, you learn a lot from drawdown and left tail risk. I know that everyone will always wants us to talk about alphas. That's sort of the sexy part of the conversation. But can you talk about maybe some of the most difficult challenges you face outside of generating unique alpha signals? The key to generating new signals is bringing in new talent, new ways of thinking, avoiding groupthink. So for me to keep ahead of the competition, keep on top of all the technological advances, it's about you know having a, a motivated, innovative research team that actually continues to build good return opportunities, good model sets. So actually identifying new talent, bring them on into the team, and evolving, I think that's probably the harder part. It sort of goes hand in hand, possibly, of generating unique alpha signals, but actually making sure that we have a robust process and a talented, motivated team is, is a challenge. It's a challenge I enjoy, but I think it's, it's important. I suspect another area, if I kept pressing you for more answers, there might be the operational side, particularly with short-term signals. For sure. Yeah, and for... I, my guess is that's an area that could be a podcast unto itself, the difficulty of implementing that sort of stuff. Can you talk to maybe some of the challenges of implementing short-term alphas versus longer-term alphas and the rising importance of estimating execution costs and those sort of concepts? Yeah, I mean, we are quite fortunate at Aspect because, you know, we have a dedicated execution research team and, you know, their job is to continuously make sure that we are honest in terms of a back test. So part of the process is to actually kick the simulation of especially our shorter term alphas to the execution research team and make sure they kick the tires. And we've been investing quite a large amount last two, three years on technology and databases to make sure we have good time stamped data and ways of processing that information. So it's not just about having the ideas, but it's actually having the infrastructure to be able to trade those ideas. The challenge is very often assuming a certain execution window or certain timestamped raw data to trade those anomalies. And actually in reality, you don't have that. You know, you have some event that's happened that's delayed your execution or the actual quoted data that is different to the what data that you downloaded. So data is a big challenge in shorter term and the accuracy of that is a big challenge here. You know, we are building a lot more on that side to circumvent that challenge. And actually before, especially on the shorter term alphas, before we start allocating external risk, external capital to those models, we go through an extended period of incubation so to make sure that we are actually the data that we're using to build those models in live trading is exactly what we used in backtest and simulation. And you wouldn't believe, but the processing time is also a challenge, you know, because you're looking at mass loads of information. So any delay in processing can cost you a lot of alpha. So a lot of those operational things become very, very important, but there are ways around it. And it goes again, back to your actual idea and the rationale behind what you're trying to capture. We're not in the, in the, in the game of actually capturing very, very you know, high frequency technical arbitrage opportunities. As someone who has been doing this for 25 years and seen the evolution of the space go from slower horizon signals, 10, 15 core models to something where you are now looking at hundreds of signals of varying lengths and time horizons. What are you most excited about in the evolution of the space over the next one, three, five years? There's a number of things, Corey. 
Actually, data probably, if I had to highlight one thing, the types of data sets that we now have access to is mind-boggling. 10, 15 years ago, when I used to be doing client meetings, I used to give examples of you know, how we build our systematic strategies. You know, I would talk about, well, one way to forecast economic growth could be business travel, right? If you see how many planes are going cross Atlantic from the UK to the US, maybe, you know, there's business travel is a leading indicator of how equity markets behave or will, will trend. But we don't have that data. We have that data and more, you know, 10, 15 years ago, or forecast data of macroeconomic forecast is available. I mean, shipping data, I mean, we have satellite images. It's a whole host of information that allows us to test relationships that we didn't imagine we could test. And then we have chat GBT, AI. So I think that makes our job a lot more exciting. You know, we're not just looking at cash yield differences and historic inflation data. We can actually use now casting to predict what inflation will be or what growth will be. So that makes a job more exciting and actually gives us a shot at actually beating the benchmark consistently. So yeah, you just have to be willing to take a risk and look into the harder to uncover, harder to find places to find those data sets that can be predictive. Well, Asif, thank you for joining me. This has been fantastic. Thank you so much, Corey. I really appreciate it.